Hello, welcome to the Pirate History Podcast. My name is Matt, thank you for listening. Last time, we talked a great deal about the Indo-European peoples, in particular the Germanic-speaking peoples of Europe. Today, we're going to shift focus and talk about a different group of linguistic cultures, the Semitic-speaking peoples. I think that, for a lot of people, when they hear Semitic, they think about Jewish people. At least, I did when I first heard about the Semitic peoples. And I think it's largely because the term anti-Semite or anti-Semitism has entered the larger lexicon. And the Jews are a group of people from the Semitic language family. Hebrew is one of a vast number of Semitic languages. But it includes a ton of other languages, many from the ancient world. You've got Sumerian and Elamite and Egyptian. For our purposes today, though, we're talking about peoples who speak the most commonly spoken Semitic language in the world. Arabic. Today we're going to be talking about some of their traditions, and if you're thinking, what in the world can this have to do with pirates? Well, I get it. But the traditions today are among the most important factors in the entire history of global pirate activity. This is episode 213, Pilgrimage. We could take the discussion of this tradition all the way back to the flood, as they say, but we're not going to. However, we will get close. Instead, we're going to look at the ninth grandson of Noah, one of the most important figures in all of world religion, Abraham. I suppose, for our purposes, it should be Ibrahim. The biblical stories of Abraham are some of the pillars upon which the Western world has been built. But there's another story that, as far as I'm aware, and I'm no religious scholar here, but as far as I'm aware, this story only appears in the Quran. In this story, Ibrahim is commanded by God to leave his wife Hajar and his infant son Ishmael in the desert, the desert of what would become Arabia. This appears to have been one of those tests of faith that God was so fond of, especially fond of heaping upon Abraham, kind of like the binding of Isaac. But Abraham did so. He left his wife and his son in the desert, in an arid patch of land between two hills called Safa and Marwa. The wife, Hajar, went searching for water and ran between those two hills several times, looking for any source of something to drink. And she failed to find any water, again and again and again. But then, upon returning to Ishmael, she found the infant kicking and scratching at the ground, and miraculously, a spring of fresh water erupted from under his feet. When Ibrahim returned, presumably to find his wife and son dead, he found them safe and sound, and hydrated. On that spot, Ibrahim was commanded to build a temple that was called the Kaaba, and I apologize for my Arabic pronunciation. It's worse than most of my other bad pronunciations. Now, and again, I'm no theologian or religious historian, but we're hard-pressed to find any evidence of the Kaaba that goes back even close to as far as the time of Abraham. Early Islamic historians will tell us that the site on which the Kaaba was built was a major center of trade even in the pre-Muslim world, but there's not really any archaeological or even contemporary documentary evidence to support that. But regardless of the historical fact here, like all the great religious stories, the story itself has power, and it has unbelievable implications on the faith and history of people all over the world. Those of you who are passingly familiar with Islam, or the story of Henry Every, probably know what we're alluding to here. But first, I'd like to mention another story. According to the Quran, Ibrahim built his temple, the Kaaba, and was graced with the Black Stone, an artifact from the Garden of Eden. And that site became a site of pilgrimage for people of many faiths, both in the Abrahamic faiths, which was basically just Judaism at the time, but also pagan faiths. It became a major trading post for all of these peoples, especially important according to some of those stories to the Silk Road and the global spice trade. And again, the 
data doesn't really support that. But even if it wasn't a center of global trade, there was a settlement there between the hills of Safa and Marwa, at a place called Mecca. The pagans who inhabited the region built Mecca into a reasonably sized city over the centuries. And they surrounded the temple that Ibrahim built, the Kaaba, with pagan idols, with their religious idols. But then, in the 600s CE, we see the rise of the Prophet Muhammad. Muhammad was born in Mecca, but he was sent to live as a sort of orphan with the Bedouin nomads in the desert. As he grew up, Muhammad worked as a merchant, trading in some of those spices, and in the year 605, he was, on a visit to Mecca, granted that black stone that had once belonged to Abraham. And then a, a bunch of religious stuff happened to Muhammad. You know, visitations by angels and a seismic religious awakening. Basically, we're talking about the birth of Islam. It was in the year 630 CE that Muhammad departed his home, when he was living in Medina at the time, for his birthplace at Mecca. And when he did so, he did so in force. This was a major military operation for Muhammad and his followers to retake the city of Mecca. There were sieges and battles and finally a conquest. By the end of this campaign in 632, Muhammad led his followers into the city of his birth. This event, Muhammad leading his followers into Mecca, is a major event in Islam. Once they held the city, Muhammad led his people in a destruction of all of those pagan idols. And finally, he taught his followers the sacred rites that were to be performed at the Kaaba, what they called the Hajj. That's a ceremony named in honor of Ibrahim's wife, Hajar, a holy figure in Islam. And that ceremony is one of the most important rites of the faith. It's one of Islam's five pillars, and it's a right that every Muslim who is capable of doing so physically and financially is expected to perform. They're supposed to travel to Mecca to undertake the Hajj. I won't detail all of the practices in this sacred rite. I'd probably get half of them wrong if I tried, but there is one in which the pilgrims are to run between the two hills of Safa and Marwa several times, much like Hajar did. But if you're wondering why we're talking about all of this, I'd... Well, I just want to illustrate to everyone exactly how important this pilgrimage is to practicing faithful Muslims. You know, according to Islamic belief, it goes back about as far back as any religious practice in the Abrahamic tradition can. It's important to their faith, and it's emotionally important to faithful Muslims. But it's also important to the political and commercial interests of people who, you know, have political and commercial interests. Every Muslim is expected to make this pilgrimage once in their life, and, you know, think about it. Imagine that it's medieval Europe, and that every Catholic was expected to travel to Rome, at least once in their life, to the Vatican. Not just the clergy, who often made that pilgrimage anyway, but everyone, every man and woman. Aside from whatever religious, faith-based worship they might experience there at the Vatican, think about the opportunity that a pilgrimage like that would provide. The opportunity to hash out contracts for trading in wine and wool, or, on a larger level, the opportunity for the really powerful to debate things like peace treaties and border disputes. Not only that, they're going to be doing so in a place of peace, neutral ground, holy ground and they would probably do so in the presence of some of the highest-ranking religious officials in their faith. And it might be difficult to coordinate the meetings of kings in Rome on this once-in-a-lifetime pilgrimage, or in Mecca, you know, we should drop the metaphor here, but their family members were going to make their own pilgrimages to Mecca. And who is to say that on such a journey, the rulers wouldn't send their viceroy or their vizier? Beyond that, if you're a king, or a sultan, or a raja, and you're going to be sending one of your kids and one of your top-ranking ministers on a pilgrimage halfway around the world, you want to make sure that they're going to be safe. So you're going to send soldiers with them. 
And if you're sending a whole caravan with grandees and soldiers to one of the most important cities in the world, there are gonna be some merchants tagging along with all of their goods. And their money. Which is to say that a caravan like that would be a prime target for raiding. In the case of early Muslim pilgrims, we're talking mostly about the Bedouin raiders, among those same groups of tribes that the Prophet lived with in his youth, but they were infamous for raiding the caravans on their way to Mecca, which hopefully is sufficient foreshadowing for what is to come. Geographically, Mecca lies almost on the west coast of the Arabian Peninsula. It's a few miles inland from the Red Sea, but it's still pretty close. It lies about halfway down the coast, from Suez to the Indian Ocean. So it's pretty far from the centers of trade in places like Jerusalem or Damascus that are closer to the Mediterranean, but in the early days of Islam, caravans to Mecca weren't all that difficult to coordinate. You know, it was mostly just people coming from other parts of Arabia and the Levant. That's totally doable, but when the Muslim world began to expand into places like Iraq and Turkey and Egypt, they did have to start organizing these grand caravans with thousands of soldiers. They would all congregate in Damascus or Cairo or Baghdad, and they would depart in one large body. But then the Islamic world began to expand even farther, across northern Africa and into Iberia, into Persia, and into the mountains of modern-day Afghanistan and Pakistan. And that's when things begin to get really tricky. It became physically and financially dangerous to undertake such a journey. The dangers, the further away you got from Mecca, just grew exponentially. You know, faithful Muslims are not supposed to harass those that are on their way to Mecca, but it still happened all the time. There were sectarian divides and political divides. I mean, there's going to be some fighting, especially when there are so many soldiers involved. Even... If the fighting itself was all unofficial, it might be under-the-table, black ops, guerrilla war type stuff, but it's still going to happen. But the biggest threats came from outside Islam. Naturally, there were a ton of pagan tribes and pagan nation-states that had no religious prohibition against attacking Muslim pilgrims. Most famously were those nomadic steppe horse archers, and later on, their successors, the Mongols, who would cause serious problems in this pilgrimage. And then there were the other faiths of the book, mostly Christianity. Both Catholics and Eastern Orthodox Christians often felt little or even no compunction in attacking these pilgrims. And the same goes both ways. You know, the Muslims attacking Christian pilgrims was a large part of the reason the causus belli, really, for the Crusades. But as time marched on, the greatest field of battle became the Mediterranean. Not for the Crusades, but for attacking pilgrims on their way to Mecca. You know, when you've got people coming from Cordoba and Morocco and the western Mediterranean, they're going to sail. And there are these orders of knights, like the, uh, like the Knights of Malta, that had pretty significant seafaring operations and used them almost exclusively against Islam. Now, we can't call them pirates because... Most of their operations were sanctioned by the powers that be, but they did toe the line, and sometimes they stepped over the line. The Knights of Malta often engaged in illegal raiding that caused real problems and international incidents and led to war sometimes. But despite all of that, they still had the support of most of Europe. But it's not the Mediterranean that concerns us here. Instead, it was other people who sailed to get to Mecca through the Indian Ocean and the Red Sea. Now, we're not going to go into that in depth today. That story is, well, one of the biggest acts of piracy that the world has ever seen. But instead I want to look at why those waters were such lucrative hunting grounds for modern-day raiders. We're talking about the Mughal Empire, specifically the Mughal Emperor, the Grand Mughal, as he was known, this figure was one of the greatest Mughal emperors in their entire dynasty, and, as some have claimed, the last great Mughal emperor. 
His name was Aurangzeb, the Jewel of the Throne. His real name was Muhi Uddin Muhammad, and he was, as you might expect, the son of the previous emperor, but he wasn't the eldest son, nor was Muhi Uddin the heir apparent. Now, succession in the Mughal Empire, well, it didn't work like it did in most of the world at the time. And by the way, at this point in our story, we're into the early modern period, the, uh, the 1600s, when Aurangzeb was coming to power, Henry Morgan was raiding Panama. But the Mughal Empire had a system that, to me, looks a lot like the early Frankish kingdom. Instead of a policy of primogeniture, in which the eldest son takes power upon their father's death, the Mughal emperors doled out parcels of their kingdom to all of their sons. Now, they could, and often did, show their preference for a potential heir in who they gave what pieces of land. You know, the best land might be the person they wanted to succeed. But ultimately, it was up to those sons to decide who was going to become emperor. Now, this could happen peacefully. Maybe all of the sons would agree on who was the right man for the job, but it almost never did. It almost always fell to war to decide who was going to take the throne. Now, this might sound a little bit crazy, but hear me out here. There's an argument to be made for this system that makes a lot more sense than primogeniture. That argument usually takes the form of a survival of the fittest argument. You know, may the strong survive, and that has some merit, but I think there's more than that to it. A system like that gives, well, not the people, but the powerful in a kingdom, in any given nation-state, it gives them a say in who's going to lead the kingdom. In both the Frankish kingdom and the Mughal Empire, there were lords and ministers and governors, basically anybody who had some influence and could bring some soldiers to the table, well, they got to choose who they were going to throw their weight behind. It's not exactly a democracy, it's not even an oligarchic republic, but it does give some of the people in the country a say, and at the very least it ensures that you're not going to get these... Milk toast kings and emperors, people like Louis the Sixteenth or Tsar Nicholas the Second. You're going to get strong, powerful, and popular emperors. In the case of Aurangzeb, there were four brothers among whom the empire was split. Two of those brothers are of little consequence, but the eldest brother, Dara Shuko, he was formidable. Dara Shuko was a liberal-minded reformer. He was an unorthodox Muslim. Literally, he, he had a soft spot for mystical sects like Sufism. He advocated for and wrote books arguing for a reformed Islam in the Indian subcontinent, a distinctly Indian form of Islam, one that was going to incorporate many of the beliefs and practices and history of the Hindu people and the Sufi people into their faith. Which brings up an interesting potential alternate history. You know, if Dara Shuko had become emperor, it's possible, even if unlikely, that he could have truly unified the Indian subcontinent just before the arrival of all of those English colonizers. And it's really not so far fetched. See, Dara Shuko was singled out as his father's preferred heir. And at least half of the court supported him in that. Darashuko had some of the best lands and the best armies in the empire. And he was beloved by the people. He was a philosopher and a poet and an artist, and he did his best to ensure that the people under his rule were taken care of. And I think all of that is great, but the problem with Darashuko is that he did not have a military mind. And his brother, the man who would become Aurangzeb, well, he did have a military mind. A great military mind, maybe the best in the empire at the time. Which provides a counterpoint for the argument I mentioned earlier. If 
Darashuko and the man who would become Aurangzeb lived in a system of primogeniture, and instead of fighting each other, they worked together. They would have stood a much greater chance of repelling all of that British colonial encroachment. But that's not what happened. Instead, their father fell ill, and they all went to war. Maybe Aurangzeb's greatest military achievement was his modernization of his armies. You know, it might be easy to picture armies of horse archers and elephants and chariots in the mold of the battles against Alexander the Great or some of those great Bollywood epics, but these were gunpowder armies. Aurangzeb in particular had giant contingents of what were essentially dragoons. We're talking about mounted musketeers. And when his father fell ill, he mobilized those forces. There were rumors that the emperor, his father, was actually dead, not just sick, and that the eldest brother, Shuko, was hiding that fact to consolidate his own power. But it wasn't just Aurangzeb. All four brothers began to mobilize their forces, but the real power was split between the two contenders, Shuko and Aurangzeb. Shuko, though also had the emperor's forces at his command, and that gave him an edge numerically, but when he finally did get his troops mobilized, he found that his younger brother was a step ahead. Aurangzeb had allied with one of the other younger brothers, whose name I'm still not going to trouble you with, and promised to split the empire with him when they were successful. The fact that I'm not bothering you with his name should tell you just how that's going to go. India pretty immediately fell into a bitter civil war. It saw city fighting city, and whole regions were thrown into turmoil. They were all fighting to join forces with the armies that supported the candidate they supported. But at every single step, Shuko found that his forces had been outplayed. While Shuko's supporters were trying to get to Shuko himself to join his army, Aurangzeb always managed to get supplies or horsemen or whatever was needed to the forces that were opposing Shuko's. Aurangzeb's men enjoyed victory after victory, but still, despite all of the losses, Shuko still had the numerical advantage. When the civil war was coming to a head, when things were getting really serious, Aurangzeb had to push his way into the mountains to assault Shuko's forces. And to do so, he split his army into two to penetrate two different mountain passes. Shuko had to split his own forces into two to counter that advance. But what's that Sun Tzu line? All warfare is based on deception. The larger part of Shuko's forces stayed with him at the larger and more important mountain pass, but his scouts returned to tell him that Aurangzeb had massed most of his forces at the other pass. It looked very much like Aurangzeb was intending to use a massive numerical advantage to push through that smaller pass. Shuko, as would any general, I imagine, sent many of his men that were there with him in the larger force to bolster the smaller. But after those scouts had reported back to Shuko once his troops were deployed to bolster that smaller force, most of Aurangzeb's larger army returned to their commander, to the now largest force, the force that was led by Aurangzeb himself, the army that was to face off against Shuko, who had just depleted his own forces. It was a brilliant tactical move. The Battle of Samugar. Well, in Enemy of All Mankind, Stephen Johnson devotes a whole chapter to Aurangzeb. It's a wonderful read, and it's part of why I wanted to do this episode. And he tells us all about the primary sources that were there on the day of the battle. And I read some of those, and I just... Well, look, this is a show that deals with things like torture and rape and murder on a pretty regular basis. But sometimes there are some sources, especially primary sources from really terrible battles that... Well, they're tough to read. And this is one of those battles. There are tales of highly trained musketeers on the side of Aurangzeb firing into a line of infantry on the side of Shuko and just tearing them in half. The greatest hardship that Aurangzeb's forces faced in this battle was, well, it wasn't the opposing army, it was a 
a river of blood and human remains that flowed downhill and made their march up through the passes really difficult. And then Aurangzeb took a fortress and held the pass. He was able to send out sorties against Shuko, his elder brother, at will. Now Shuko tried to hold strong once he realized his mistake, or rather, once he realized the deception against him, he sent for those forces to come back and reinforce him. And that army that he had reinforced was victorious on the day. But Aurangzeb's smaller force kept them occupied just long enough that it would be impossible for them to return in time to save the heir apparent. Darashuko was forced to flee the field of battle. Now, by this point, the war wasn't over, but it was pretty much over. Once word began to spread that Shuko had been forced to flee, his supporters began to abandon him. Before long, he was captured and executed. But here's the rub. The emperor, their father, was not dead. He was still alive. He recovered from his illness and was still technically in power. But by this point, much of the court, most of the court, were allied behind Aurangzeb. So the emperor, the old emperor, was retired. He was confined to a palace, you know, for his health, and he was put under the care of one of his daughters, one of Aurangzeb's sisters. But she was fiercely loyal to Aurangzeb, and she was going to become a major power broker in the Mughal Empire, and she will concern us later on. But for now, the jewel of the throne... Aurangzeb was victorious. He wasn't quite done fighting. He still had two other brothers that had to be betrayed and executed to consolidate his power. But the result of that was never in doubt. Aurangzeb... Well, his older brother and his father had been liberal-minded reformers and unorthodox Muslims, but Aurangzeb was a very orthodox conservative Muslim. And one tradition that had begun to lapse under his father and older brother was that of the Hajj, the pilgrimage to Mecca. You know, it was difficult to get from India to Arabia. Doing so overland was out of the question. There were too many mountains and too many enemies to pass by, but doing so by sea was possible. However, in recent years, the arrival of the Portuguese and the Dutch, and more recently the English, had made that a dangerous proposition. Aurangzeb, though, was not going to ignore that tradition. Much like those early Islamic pilgrims, Aurangzeb armed those men and women that were making their way to Mecca heavily. But in their case, it wasn't horses, it was ships. Some of the best ships in the world, some of the biggest, fastest ships in the world, loaded down with cannons and marines, and more treasure than you could possibly imagine. The question is, how do you think a man like that, a man that killed three of his brothers and imprisoned his father to take power, a conservative tyrant, how do you think he is going to respond when a small fleet of English sea raiders arrives at the Gate of Tears, at the mouth of the Red Sea, and captures some of his ships. Ships that were on their way to their pilgrimage at Mecca, and in doing so, insults his empire and his family. Next time we're going to return to the Deck of the Fancy and the story of Henry Every. I'd like to thank everybody for listening. I'd like to thank everybody who has helped to support the show. Everybody who has signed up to become a patron on Patreon, everybody who has recommended this show online or in real life, and everybody who has left us ratings or reviews. You all make this possible. Thank you. I'd also like to mention that on the website, under the contact tab, is my email address, and I've recently begun getting quite a few emails from many of you. I don't necessarily have time to respond to all of them, and I don't sometimes know what to say, but so many of you have been so supportive and kind, and some of you have shared stories from your own lives that have been extremely touching. 
And some of you have told me about family history, for which I am very jealous. Those of you who, for example, are related to Henry Every. I just want to say that even if I don't respond personally, and I try to when I can, but even if I don't, I read them and it means a lot that you guys reach out. So I want to say thank you for that as well. Our theme music was, as always, The Old Captain by the fantastic band Brillig. If you haven't checked them out yet, let's be honest, you've checked them out, but you should go back to their website at brillig.com.au. That's B-R-I-L-L-I-G dot com dot A-U. After you're done over there, you can find our website at piratehistorypodcast.com. As always, and most importantly, thank you for listening.